Hello, my name is Daniel Balsam, and today we'll be visiting Area 5150. Is everybody here familiar with this demo or at least familiar with the demo scene? So when I say a demo, you know what I'm talking about. Well, who am I? Um, over the past two years, I've been working on Marty PC. It's an open source, cycle accurate PC emulator. Um, there's my GitHub, there's my blog. But I spent literally months working on this demo, um, studying it, debugging it to get it to run in my emulator which it does, off and on. <laughs> there are some flashing lights. I think due to the lighting setup, it's not going to be a problem. But if you're photosensitive, just take precautions. So Area 5150 was a demo released in 2022 after several hard years of work. It was a follow-up to the same group's previous demo, 8088 miles per hour, which you may have also heard of. This demo runs on an unmodified IBM 5150 as long as you have 640K of memory and a CGA card. And it won the Evoke 2022 Demo Party Competition in the category Alternative Platforms. The only reason it didn't win the PC platform, in my opinion, is that the PC category is for modern computers with graphics cards and CPUs that are faster than a calculator. The title, of course, is a play on the IBM Model 5150, which was the original PC, and Area 51, which is that mysterious Air Force base in the desert where they keep the frozen aliens. And like any good demo, it does several seemingly impossible things on the IBM 5150, sometimes at the same time. So to give you a bit of context, it's good to re remember what the CGA used to look like, right? You had three palettes you could choose from, each having a lovely four colors. The one on the left there is my favorite palette. I call it the Pepto-Bismol and Cyanide palette. Um, you could change the, the background color, or the, the, that was usually black. You could change that to any of the other colors. Um, but the IBM PC was just not, didn't have a good reputation as being a graphics powerhouse or even a good gaming machine until at least the EGA came out and we had Commander Keen. So bear that in mind. This is a machine that was targeted for doing things like spreadsheets. And what you're about to see just kind of blows your mind in that context. So let's take a look at the intro. Keep in mind that the CGA card in graphics mode can only do four colors. So what just happened there? We had 16 colors on screen at once. How do you do 16 colors on the CGA? Well, there's, there's one way. You can use the composite output of the CGA. And for example, a black and white image is interpreted as the color carrier on a television set, and it turns into the image on the right, which is really cool. Um, their previous demo, 88 miles per hour, used this extensively. But this demo does not. It uses a standard RGBI monitor, so we can't use this trick. Some games use the mid-frame palette change. So this is California Games by Epix. We're switching palettes about halfway down the screen, so we can have a nice blue sky and ocean and green grass on the bottom. But there's just way too many colors in that demo to have this be the answer. So there is one mode on the CGA that has all 16 colors available all the time. Can anyone guess? Yes, text mode. <laughs> In text mode, every character on screen is accompanied by an attribute byte, 
and the attribute byte provides a four-bit color reference for your foreground and background color. So this means we can independently select the foreground and background color of a glyph from any of the 16 colors a CGA can produce, as seen below. And this is the, the font that's burned onto a ROM on the CGA card. It's mapped to IBM code page 437. I've inverted it once below for some demonstration purposes here. Um, IBM was kind enough to provide these helpful line and box drawing characters. These specifically are useful. You've got some gradients, um, shading characters, and you've got these full and half character drawing uh, characters, so you can do blocks of color in four pixel increments. Lots of games use text mode. You have everything from Rogue to ZZT, uh, but you could definitely tell a game was using text mode. It didn't really look like graphics mode. And there was a thriving scene creating ANSI art. You could see those scroll by on your bulletin board when you logged in. Uh, but what if we could kind of take this technique of ANSI art and kick it up a notch? You could only display a portion of each character glyph, and it turns out you can. So this enables a te technique that the demo scene guys dubbed ANSI from hell. So if we're just drawing the top scan line, we can draw any of these character patterns, these two color spans of eight pixels. And note that inverting the colors, or inverting the glyphs gives us a whole new set of patterns. And if we are brave enough to use the top two rows of each character glyph, we get more patterns. And notice those little shaded gradient characters are now very useful. But also another advantage of doing this is now you can write 16 pixels with two bytes. I know this is kind of hard to believe, so it's good to see it in action. So this is a really zoomed in text mode. We got some asterisks. We got an A with an accent and a five. Everybody see that? And let's just pan around a bit and then zoom out real far. It's pretty cool, huh? This is already some neat ANSI art, but now what we can do is um, shrink the character cell height a scan line at a time. And so the CG had a very squished aspect ratio, 640 by 200, but your monitor would stretch it back out to a 4-3 aspect ratio. And so this is the final result. Graphics drawn with text. So that IBM graphic we saw in the little intro sequence actually is, looks like that in video memory. It's very clever. There is a downside to using text mode for graphics. Um, as you may know, you can't write to video memory in 80 column text mode during the display area or you get something called snow where these little uh, snowflakes glitches show up on the screen. Uh, so now you can only really do your video updates in the blanking areas. H blank is hard to hit, so it's almost practically you're just doing it in the vertical blanking period. What's really impressive is that you'll see this entire demo, 99% of it is in text mode. Some of it is doing 60 frames per second effects, and you'll never see snow on the screen ever. But that intro sequence also did another impossible thing. Do you recall it erased the overscan? And the overscan was this thick border that was around the CGA screen. It didn't represent video memory. All you could really do is change the color of it, <laughs> but you couldn't draw in there. Uh, some games used the overscan for gameplay purposes. Like here's Alley Cat. This is a cat swimming in a kind of a fantastically oversized fishbowl. As you got closer to drowning, the screen would get more desperate in the overscan color. So how, how are we doing this? Because you can't do that. You just you can't erase the overscan. You can't draw on the overscan. So to understand the trick behind that, we have to understand a little bit about the CGA card, or more specifically, the brain of the CGA, the Motorola MC6845 cathode ray tube controller, we just call it the CRTC. 
the job of the CRTC is to define all the display timings in terms of a grid of character cells. Even in the CGA's graphics mode, the display is constructed out of logical character cells. And if you're familiar with how that works in graphics mode, you know it's an ugly hack. Uh, note that the display field is really a timing diagram. So we've got H blank and V blank periods that you never see, but those are the periods in which the monitor is returning the raster from one side of the screen to the other, or from, from the bottom to the top. To program the CRTC, you had this register file, and these define the parameters that describe the screen. So for example, your horizontal total register is the total width of the display field in character cells, whereas horizontal displayed is just the displayed columns. You can see it's 80. And similarly, you have vertical total, and vertical displayed is 25, so this is standard 80 by 25 text mode. This is the register that let us do the ANSI from hell magic. This maximum scan line register, R9, controls how many scan lines plus one are used to draw a character cell. So you can dial it all the way down to one scan line. So the display field for the CGA is relatively large compared to the display area, as you'll notice. This is a consequence of IBM using the NTSC television display standard for the CGA's video timings because they wanted you to hook it up to a TV. And in fact, for like the first year and a half of the CGA's life, that was your only option. They hadn't released the IBM 5153 monitor yet. So there's the overscan periods are not required by the monitor or the card or by the timings. It's a consequence of the difference between such a large display field and such a little amount of VRAM. You just normally couldn't fill the screen. But nothing stops you from defining a mode that does completely fill the screen with no overscan. And that's what this effect did. You can see that there's no overscan. We are having a text mode that is now drawing the blue border with blue glyphs or colors. And since now we're drawing the overscan ourselves, the overscan, um, we can erase it and animate it with gradient characters to make it look like it's disappearing. And there is a transition point where it goes from overscan to fake overscan, and it's almost seamless. It's a really beautiful trick. So that's two tricks down, really. <laughs> but the demo has several and more for us. And I, I'd like to just play the rest of the demo now. This is about eight minutes, and I'm just going to sit here awkwardly.
for the abrupt transition there it does abruptly switch to the end credits at that point and that's an effect i need to talk about on its own um, so how did we how did any of that actually happen <laughs> um just to give you context i had a little basic program that drew a wireframe space shuttle and it took like 30 seconds and we just saw like a voxel landscape being drawn in real time um, the cga card is like a maximum throughput of 340 kilobytes a second and at 60 frames per second that only gives you five kilobytes of frame and the full screen of that ANSI from Hell Graphics is 16 kilobytes so the math isn't working in our favor. Um, so I need to explain the primary trick which allows this to be possible. It's a technique that allows us to display and animate a full screen of graphics while minimizing the video memory 
required, or at least the transfers. And this trick is called frame restart. So when you set up your screen parameters, you provide the CRTC with a relative start address in memory to start counting from. It's, uh, it's basically the video memory address for the top left character cell. And this start address is used to draw the entire frame, uh, counting by rows. But it's only ever set once per frame, which is pretty boring. But it turns out you can trick the CRTC by setting a value for vertical total that is less than vertical sync. And when the CRTC encounters vertical total, it thinks, oh, I'm done drawing the screen. I'm going to draw a new screen now. And it will latch the start address again. And as you can see, if you don't change the start address, you just get a copy of the screen again. So, But if you happen to have changed the start address, you'll get a completely different position in video memory. So you actually have the capability for a full split screen on the CGA before EGA made that an official feature. And we're not even limited to splitting the screen once or twice. We can do it 100 times. The only limitation is that the minimum height of a frame must be two logical rows. So that limits us to updating the start address every other scan line. So remember that limitation because it'll be important later. And there is one downside to this technique. Uh, while you're doing this, it's effectively disabled vSync. So on the last frame, you have to program the CRTC to finish the rest of the display field, including allowing a vertical sync to occur and at the right time, or your monitor will be very upset at you. Now, the CGA doesn't have a great way of telling you where you are on the screen, so to pull this off, you have to pull the CGA status register to detect blanking periods. And uh, when you detect you're in a blanking period, you can count uh, one scan line. And so this requires a lot of polling. Here I have uh, instrumented reads to the CGA status register in pink pixels. So you can see how much this effect is desperately pulling to find out what scan line it's on. But what's the point in splitting the screen up into pieces and adjusting start addresses? Well, if we modify the start address by a word, we can scroll the whole screen to the left or back to the right. And if we modify the start address by a whole row, then we can scroll the screen up and down. Although there is this interesting offset um, that we have to keep uh, or account for. Notice that we see the top of video memory again because the CGA is helpfully wrapping the C CRT address around. So I wanted to kind of spy on what Area 5150 was doing, but uh, I had a traditional memory viewer that was just a hex view, and it's very hard to see what's going on with the hex view. It's like trying to stare into the matrix. So I built this little special visualizer tool that could spy on Area 5150's video memory and actually render it as colored character glyphs. And we can even adjust the maximum scan line count for each character glyph just like we can on the real thing. So we're going to use this tool to kind of reveal the secrets of a lot of these tricks. So this is the first effect that really kind of blows people's socks off. It's a full screen 60 frames per second animation. Uh, this kind of makes you question everything you know about what the, CG, uh, the IBM PC was capable of. So let's take a look in our memory visualizer at what's going on. And you can see that the entire gears effect is actually pulled off with three character rows worth of glyphs that are animated with gradients. And as we draw the screen, we split it up into enough frames and stretch it out so those three character rows can cover the whole screen. And you can see um, the text scroll in the middle. It's all those white glyphs. Those are really stretched out very wide. But when that, um, we reach the center of the screen, we simply set the start address to start scrolling through the, the text. Similarly, this stretchy ribbon, you can see that it doesn't actually change in video memory at all, except when we change the color of it. The whole stretch and squash is done through frame restart and address manipulation. 
and the the way it looks like it's twisting is actually just an optical illusion. This one's neat because you're looking at the entirety of video memory in that window on the right. There's no if we scroll down now, you're just going to see the top of this image come back. So how do we scroll this and see something new? We have to just basically frantically write new video data in a memory just as we scroll into it. And if we can keep that up, we can actually scroll forever, which is kind of cool. Infinite scrolling on the CGA. <laughs> I like the little bounce at the end. Let's just rewind the start address a little bit and then put it back. Um, it's another beautiful effect, another 60 frames per second animation. We got parallax, and then they're going to kick it up a notch and do transparency right now. <laughs> um, obviously, not enough video bandwidth to actually do that. It's impossible. But if we look at our visualizer, we can see the trick. Just a very little slice of video memory is actually updated, and we use the frame restart to copy and stretch it out all the way across the screen. But even doing that little slice is, is not easy. Uh, so all 420 frames of that effect are pre-calculated. This one's a nice callback to the video game Digger. It's got some sprites from that. So. Notice the stripes in the corners. Those are there to distract you from how this effect is actually being done. Because copying these giant sprites um, and scrolling them obviously would just be impossible on this hardware. So if we look at our video memory, we can see that those giant sprites don't move at all. It's the stripes that do. And it looks, still looks like we're doing a lot of video copies, but it's only the start and the end of the stripes that actually have to be drawn. And so if we change this to show us deltas between frames, now we can see just how little video, video memory actually has to be updated per frame. So now this is well within the CGA's capabilities. It's really beautiful optimization. This Marble Madness effect is great. It's another infinite scroller, but now we've got a sprite on top. The edges of the sprite are a little fuzzy, but it's still impressive. And uh, as we see, we can not just scroll down, we can also scroll to the left. And they're carefully taking into account those strange offsets as you get when you wrap video memory around. And notice our call out to our favorite chip, the MC6845. What's really funny about this is um, look how much better this looks compared to the actual port of Marble Madness the PC got. <laughs> I'd love to see a full game done with that, that technology. This is a neat effect. I mean, they're all neat. I'm going to repeat myself a lot. Um, the top and bottom of this screen is text mode but the center of the screen is graphics mode. Did you know that you could switch between text and graphics mode uh, uh, mid-frame on the CGA? Well, now you do. And the scrolling, the animation of the polygon is made more smooth than it might otherwise appear because we're using interrupts to move the region of memory in which it's drawn up and down. And I'm happy to report there's absolutely no trick here. <laughs> this is just simply some amazing coding by Rhea Nigni. Um, this is just a voxel landscape rendered on an 8088. Absolutely insane. And it's not even pre-calculated. There's an Easter egg. If you start pressing the arrow keys during the demo, you can fly around yourself. So no trick, <laughs> just amazing coding. Not so with this one, though. <laughs> This is really cool. Like, uh, you know, you don't see parallax scrolling like this unless you have like an Amiga or something, right? Hate to spoil it, but the video memory doesn't actually change at all. We've divided it into horizontal stripes, which are 
they don't actually overlap. The transitions between each strip is carefully hidden by matching gradients. And we can just wiggle the UFO up and down by changing the start address at different positions each frame. Still really impressive. I mean, we're changing what impresses me about these things, not just from like, oh, it's doing the impossible, but just how clever these, the, the timing required to track each scan line and update the start address and start a new frame at exactly that point is, is incredible on its own. And this is the penultimate effect. This shows just the extreme of what you can do with frame restart. Obviously, all of this is done by manipulating the start address of a static image. They're actually updating the start address every scan line. And remember I said you couldn't do that? <laughs> so the end credits uses a similar technique, and I'm going to explain how that's done after we watch the end credits. <laughs> Hearing that come out of your PC speaker is a bit of a surprise. <laughs> I did actually hook my subwoofer up to it, and it does really rattle your windows. So I probably don't need to tell you that the water rippling effect is done with frame restart and changing the start address to just wiggle around and manipulate the top part of the graphics you're seeing. Just in case you're still suspicious that this is text mode, these are the glyphs that make up the sun. But if we take a look at the water rippling effect, we can see that we're actually updating the start address. Um, we got per scan line updates going on. So how is this happening? Because I just told you that wasn't possible a minute ago. Well, the only limitation is that every CRTC frame must have two logical rows, start row and an end row. But they don't have to be top and bottom. What if they could be side by side? then both rows would fit on one scan line. And you could have a frame that was a single scan line. It's easier said than done. This requires eight CRTC register writes per scan line. This breaks your emulator. <laughs> Most emulators will draw the CGA every scan line based on the status of the CRTC registers at the end of the scan line. And th that technique just falls apart here. And remember how frame restart requires constant polling of the status register so you know where you are on screen? Well, these CRTC updates take a lot of time. So there's no time to pull the status register anymore. So the question is, how do you know where you are on screen or when a new scan line should start or when you should start a B-Sync? And that requires a little segue. Let's talk about clocks. On the original PC and XT, the system timer, CPU, and CGA card are driven off the same roughly 14 megahertz source crystal. They use different clock divisors, though. 
So for example, the system crystal is divided by three for the CPU, and that's the source of the 8088's strange 4.77 megahertz clock speed. Again, it's a fallout for IBM wanting to use the NTSC display standard. But knowing that everything's driven off the same basic clocks and with you know integer relationships, we can do some math. So one CGA scan line is not exactly 912 system ticks. One CPU cycle is exactly three pixels drawn on the screen. So one CGA scan line is exactly 304 CPU cycles. Uh, so all we have to do to stay in sync with the CGA card and not blow up the monitors, make sure that our code draws every scan line in exactly 304 CPU cycles. Easy, right? So for the top of the screen, we have absolute madness, where we're doing our cycle counted scan lines. And this is why this effect doesn't work in your emulator and it doesn't work on anything but an 8088 running at 4.77 megahertz. It will not work on your V20. It will not work on your clone PC unless it's nearly perfect. It also accounts for cycles lost to DRAM DMA refresh. Reignigny, the genius that made this effect, calculated that into the 304 cycles. So if you have a clone or modern reproduction with SRAM, you're also out of luck. So once we've drawn all the graphics and we're down in the yellow region, we can program a VSync to occur and then we can relax a bit. I say relax, but you still have to do the slideshow and generate audio samples with a mod player for the 8088. Not like that's easy. This time the mod player is a single channel compared to the four channel mod player seen in the previous demo, 8088 miles per hour, but there's a lot less time that could be spent on it. And once we're done processing this frame, we can simply wait for our VSync interrupt to start the next frame of the effect for us. Except the CGA doesn't have a VSync interrupt. Well, that's not a problem, right? In our math, we determined that one CGA frame is exactly 19,912 timer ticks. So we just program that into timer channel zero, which gets hooked up to the interrupt line. And now we can have an interrupt routine that is called on every frame in exactly the same pixel on each frame. And this is where Area 5150's VSync interrupt must fire, right here. This little gap is finishing up the last instruction because we only honor an interrupt at the end of an instruction. This yellow line is all the microcode for the interrupt routine running, and it drops us right into the effect interrupt routine right at the very beginning of the scan line, actually two scan lines above the actual graphics because there's some setup. This is a very small window to hit. <laughs> Look how tiny. How is this interrupt positioned though? This isn't just at VSync. It's not immediately after display enable. It's just in this exact specific spot. The way this interrupt is set up is something that I affectionately call the gauntlet. <laughs> and this breaks your emulator. <laughs> the effect is positioned using seven timer ISRs that incrementally adjust the position of the effect interrupt until it's in their exact right position on screen. And while this is going on, the CRTC is programmed for very strange video modes like 64 scan line high screens. And um, there's approximately 80,000 clock cycles between the start and end of the gauntlet. It requires almost perfect interrupt timing emulation, including the timings for resuming from halt, which can be a little mysterious. You've got to have your perfect DRAM refresh DMA emulation. And you've got to handle obscure things on the 6845 like the fact when you're putting your rows side by side, that has a side effect of shortening having your VSync period. Also requires actually sub-cycle modeling of the 8253 timer chip. If you write a new counter value too close to the falling edge of the timer's clock, it will latch it on that clock. Um, so when you come out at the end of the gauntlet, you have to be like within five CPU cycles or the entire effect. 
turns into spaghetti. I've seen a lot of these screenshots. <laughs> so I call this effect the, the, the lake effect, um, and it is really the end boss of original PC emulation. So I hope it gave you a good idea of what makes this demo so impressive and so cool and how they pulled it off on such ancient hardware. And I'd like to thank everybody for CR CRTC and Hornet for making such a fantastic work of art for all of us to enjoy and for me to tear my hair out trying to get working. And thanks to Jim for having me at this year's VCF Midwest. It's my first event. And thank you all for coming to my talk. If anyone has any questions, they can walk up to the Q&A mic here and ask them. So are you going to update your code to work with Jim's next demo called Area 4860? I am absolutely terrified about what Reignini will figure out. Because IBM 4860 is the PC Junior or the Peanut. So. Oh, yes. I hear he's working on something special. Yeah, we, uh, I heard some rumors about that. I am working on PC Junior emulation for Marty PC. So I'm prepared to tackle whatever he can throw my way. Are there any FPGA-based emulators that it works on? Or you know that they're actually considering? I need, I'd love to learn more about FPGA programming. Uh, it might as well be like wizard science to me. I don't know anything about it. <laughs> there are currently no FPGA emulators that can run it right now. I'm curious as to how often some of these tricks actually end up in actual products. Because of the polling required, I don't know how many of these effects are really practical for games. But um, there were some things like, I think Zaxxon had some primitive like racing the beam. And um, obviously California Games is doing mid-frame stuff. And uh, there is one game called Jungle Hunt, which uses this extremely obscure way to tell when to change its palette. It uses the light pen registers. That, that's fun. So. I don't know, I think Marble Madness, I think you could probably turn that into a game. I think you could. Um, I'd like to applaud the ingenuity you've used to deduce these and incorporate them in your emulator. Oh, thank you. Um, one th question I ask is, like, any modern chip of any kind would have, you know, lots of variation in timing due to cache misses or such thing. Like, how do you, I mean, how do you know that the timing of these things is going to be accurate enough to not cause, you know, single cycle variations or, 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 you know, that would shift scan lines over left and right. That would make the. the so uh, you probably want to go back and go to YouTube and look for the VCF East. And I did a talk um, this year on cycle accurate 8088 emulation. I covered a lot of that ground. Uh, there were hardware techniques employed. Um, controlling an 8088 with an Arduino, and I built a bus sniffer and a, a logic analyzer decoder for the 8088. So I could look at how a full system actually ran the code. I have a complete bus sniff of the entire lake effect running. <laughs> and so I can go see like when the timer was written to and when the timer responded. And so I know exactly where my emulator breaks. I just know, I don't always know where, how to fix it. <laughs> Thank you. I'm just wondering if there was anything on the sound side that broke your emulator. Because really, that seemed pretty um, aggressive for PC speaker. I was enjoying that mod player long before the effect ever like stopped looking like scrambled eggs. Um, the mod player in 88 miles per hour is a lot more CPU, like it needs a lot more accuracy because it's, uh, it uses self-modifying code. I don't know if Ria Nigni used that in this one. But it, it seems to be a lot more resilient to, to, to inaccuracies. Of course, having accurate timer emulation is crucial for any of that stuff to sound <laughs> decent at all. All right, well, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you again.